Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Democratic Presidential Forum, a debate and discussion with three candidates that the DNC doesn't really want you to hear from. President Biden has been anointed the Democratic candidate. They clearly hope to avoid any serious challenge. The president's supporters even trying to keep these candidates off ballots. But we believe that should be your decision. You may like what they have to say, you may not, but that's what voting is supposed to be all about. So joining me now is three-term Democratic Congressman Dean Phillips from Minnesota, author Marianne Williamson, who also ran for the Democratic presidential nomination in 2020, and Cenk Uger, the founder and host of The Young Turks. We invited President Biden to join, and he did not even respond to our request. Now remember, people like Cornell West and Robert F. Kennedy Jr., for example, are not here because they're running as independents. Here today are candidates challenging President Biden in the Democratic primary. Like any other debate, we will be giving them a serious platform and asking tough questions. Now, you see a clock there up on the screen. Each candidate is going to have either 60, 45, or 30 seconds to answer in an effort to give everyone equal opportunity to speak and to ensure we get to cover a number of topics. And we will be including <coughs> your questions throughout the hour. So let's start big picture. Many Democrats, not just President Biden, are worried about all of your candidacies simply hurting President Biden, nothing more. Congressman Phillips, Democratic Senator John Fetterman described your candidacy as a dream for Donald Trump. Is that a concern of yours? You have 60 seconds. Well, with all due respect to Senator Fetterman, the dream for Donald Trump is Joe Biden. And I think my associates, Cenk and Marianne, would agree that we are actually not united in opposition to one another. We are united in opposition to Donald Trump. And the Democratic delusion right now among senators and members of Congress that somehow we are hurting Joe Biden's chances, that's not true. Joe Biden has hurt his chances. And the reality is it's a dream come true for Donald Trump. Just want to make that clear to everybody watching. Uh, Ms. Williamson, are you worried about your candidacy simply yeah. helping Donald Trump? No, I absolutely agree with what Dean Phillips just said. Where the three of us agree is more significant than where we disagree. What we agree about is that the Democrats are sleepwalking to disaster in 2024. It's like walking, watching a, a car crash in slow motion. This will be much more like 2016 than the race of 2020. And the Democratic elite are as blind now as they were in 2016 to what's going on in this country. And they think that they can just will themselves into the White House, and it doesn't work that way. There's a rumbling out there in this country, and it is not responding to what the Democrats are offering. And I think it would respond much more to what any of the three of us are offering. Mr. Uger, uh, I know you're not worried about this issue either. No sitting president has uh, lost the party's nomination uh, to a primary challenger in modern U.S. history, right? And unlike uh, Congressman Phillips and, and Ms. Williamson, you're on a very limited number of ballots. You're not even mentioned in a lot of major polls. Realistically, lay out for me how you have a path to victory. Right. So there's a, a lot of parts to this answer. First of all, strong primaries give you strong candidates. So back in 2016, the Republicans had the toughest primary anybody's ever seen, and they won. In 2020, the Democrats had 27 people in the race, and they won. So the more voices there are in the Democratic Party against Donald Trump and in favor of Democratic policies, the better the Democratic Party does. So every one of us is helping the Democratic Party become stronger. If Joe Biden was here, let's be honest, about 10 times as many people would watch and 10 times as many people would hear Democratic policies, Democratic arguments and arguments against Trump. For me personally, I'm a naturalized citizen and I'm fight, fighting for the rights of 24 million naturalized citizens. And the 14th Amendment says that we have equal protection and due process rights. And so we're in a protected class, just like gender, race, gender identity, et cetera. And we're going to prove in court, and we're going to the circuit court, we're appealing in South Carolina right now as we speak. And we're going to win that case. And once we do, okay. think about it this way, Time. Dan. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to come back to that issue about uh, the 14th Amendment, et cetera. But um, Ms. Williamson, let me ask you the, the, the same question. 
This is your second run uh, yeah. for the White House. You ran in 2020. You pulled out before the first yeah. primary yeah. Uh, last time. You're in a crowded field. Uh, you're, you've got about 6 percent support right now in the no, Democratic. No, Quinnipiac yesterday. I cast it. was at 13 percent. All right. Look, whatever the number, it's, it's, a, it's a minimal number. Um, what is your practical, realistic path to victory? I actually, the numbers that I have, even when they are totally neck and neck with, let's say, Nikki Haley, hers is called a surge. Mine is just another reason to erase or invisibilize. So, no, I'm not enrolled in your idea. Given how little the mainstream media has been willing to cover me, even though I am an FEC registered qualified candidate, given how I've been erased, given how I've been mocked on the presidential stage, given how I've been smeared, I think I'm doing really well, actually, and that continuation of those double digits. But what's the path to victory? What's the, the victory yeah. at this point in American politics is that I'm speaking what needs to be said. Okay. This, our political system is so riddled with illusion and lies and injustice. Someone simply laying it down and saying what the American people are saying, which is contrary to what the political elite is saying, that's a victory well, in and of itself. Let's talk about the political elite, uh, Congressman. The DNC is telling people in New Hampshire, where you've been spending a lot of time, that it's really meaningless because they're not going to count the delegates anyway. So they're saying this is all for nothing. Even if they're wrong in what they're doing, do they have a point that you're sort of wasting your time in New Hampshire? Oh, my goodness. None of the three of us are wasting our time. In fact, I'm sitting next to two Americans of great courage and great conviction, and we should celebrate participation right now. The fact that the party we represent, the Democratic Party, would have the audacity to tell New Hampshire voters that their primary is meaningless, that would actually require a letter from the state of New Hampshire back to the Democratic National Committee to cease and desist because it is the unlawful suppression of voters? I mean, come on. That's what we're so, facing right now. And by the way, Florida, North Carolina, too, it's the same thing. So the answer is no, it's not meaningless. In fact, I think, no, I think New Hampshire is going to change the entire trajectory of this entire race. Mr. Uger, I want to ask you the first question from one of our, our viewers in 30 <laughs> seconds. This is Elizabeth from Texas. She says, you're not supporting our president against what will be a pro-autocracy <coughs> opponent, no matter who the Republican nominee may be. If you are true servant leaders, wouldn't you wish to protect everyday Americans more than your own failed ambitions? <laughs> Okay, well, that's a nice question. <laughs> so here's the deal, guys. Joe Biden's going to lose. I hate to break your heart, exactly. but he's at 33 percent. If you say, no, I saw him at a poll at 36 or 38, it doesn't matter. No incumbent that has been in the 30s in an election year has ever come back to it, not just for president, for any federal office. It's already over. <laughs> what we're trying to do is snap you out of it because we're going to lose to Trump. I think democracy is on the line. And these folks are canceling the elections and primaries when their tagline yeah. is democracy is on the line. No, there's no way Joe Biden can win. He is 19 points lower than when he won last time. 19 points. Wake up. He's definitely going to lose. Let's you need another candidate, a strong candidate that's going to fight for you instead of sitting in a bunker and napping all day long. Let's, let's talk some policy, and this may take us uh, in different directions. <clears throat> Ms. Williamson, let me uh, start with you. Um, what is the issue where you differ most from President Biden? President Biden is trying to alleviate the stress of millions and millions of Americans who are living at the effect of an unjust economy. I want to end the injustice. He will do whatever he can to make life a little better for people, but only until the point where to go any further would challenge the profit maximization goals of the donor and billionaire class. We need fundamental economic reform. We need universal health care. We need tuition-free college and tech school. We need guaranteed living wage. We need guaranteed sick pay. We need paid family leave. I, I, we need a fundamental economic U-turn in this country. And the president is taking this incremental approach to making things better for people whose lives are suffering. 39 percent of Americans now say they regularly skip meals in order to pay their rent. The majority of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. The majority of Americans cannot afford a $500 unexpected expenditure, and the president is saying the economy is doing well. Well, I'm going to get back to another question on the economy. Congressman Phillips, same question to you. What is the issue where you differ most from President Biden? Let's give credit to where it's due. Uh, president Biden saved our country, and he's made investments in America. That's what the CHIPS Act was, the infrastructure bill. I salute that. I voted for it. I helped uh, market it. But what he has not done is invest in Americans, what Marianne just said, housing, 
health care, education, food and fuel so expensive. We have a crisis of costs and chaos. The other area where I differ with him immensely is our southern border. I've been there twice, Dan. It is an unmitigated, embarrassing, unforgivable disaster. And Democrats, as Cenk said earlier, have to wake up to the truth. The more we ignore it, the more we pave a path for Donald Trump to return to the White House. Because you know what? He's actually listening. And I think it's time that Democrats do. And I'm afraid that President Biden is at a stage where he has lost the ability to legitimately listen. In fact, where is he? I know he probably couldn't be here today, but to tell the country that he will not debate a single time in a Democratic primary of such consequence, that's perhaps the biggest point of differentiation, differentiation between him, right. Cenk, Marianne, and me, is showing up. Mr. Uger, same question to you. Where is the area where you differ most from President Biden? So at this point, it's Israel and Gaza, but I'm sure we're going to come back to that. No, pl please feel free to. So, yeah, I mean, that's the issue. Yeah, he's been monstrous on that. Uh, so he's greenlighted the uh, massacres and the war crimes that Israel's committed. He's sending our taxpayer dollars to go kill innocent Palestinians, 23,000 dead already. Enough, enough. How much are, are they going to kill How, with our money? I don't want my money to go kill Palestinian children. So that's point one. Point two, on the policies uh, on the domestic level, it sounds like we have a lot of agreement, but the, you have to remember that Joe Biden didn't actually do a lot of these things. So the infrastructure, no problem, great. Credit where credit is due. I agree with Dean, right? So we're not saying it's a black and white thing. But in terms of the policies that he promised, $15 minimum wage, he said it was a bare minimum. He threw it under the bus immediately. Paid family leave, polls at 84%, and he won't fight for it. If you can't get something passed that's at 84%, you're not a very good politician. Public option, he didn't even propose it. Con Why did you? So honestly, I yeah. think that he's he was lying. Congressman Phillips, do you agree uh, with Mr. Uger about Israel? He says that the president's policy has been a disaster. I think, Dan, two things can be true at once. I have great affection for Israel. Uh, it is the only majority Jewish nation in the entire world. When the first boats left Europe at the dawn of the Holocaust and came to this country, we turned them away. I'm a Jewish man. I intend to be the first Jewish president in American history who signs documents recognizing a Palestinian state. I care deeply about my Palestinian brothers and sisters like I do my Israeli brothers and sisters. I think two things can be true at once. Democrats can support Israel and Democrats can support Palestinians. And I think we should transcend all of this by favoring humanity. And that's who I am. I will fiercely defend Israel and I will fiercely defend the recognition of a Palestinian but, state and self-determination. But, Ms. Williamson, uh, Mr. Uger has made very strong comments that are not sort of nuanced the way that Mr. Phillips, Congressman Phillips is saying. Is your position that Mr. Uger is right, that the president's policies have been a disaster? Or do you generally support what President Biden has been doing with regard to Israel? I, I'm with Dean Phillips on this. Uh, our, highest, uh, our highest allegiance must be to humanity itself. Um, as uh, I appreciated the president's moral clarity on October 7th, but we've needed a lot more moral clarity about what has been shown to the Palestinians since then. Uh, I do not agree with this war. Uh, I don't think it's good for Israel. I don't think it's good for the Palestinians. I, as evil as the events of October 7th were, I do not believe that this war is justified. We need an immediate ceasefire. I said that even before they started. This was not the thing to do. And I do not think that Netanyahu is good for the Jews. I don't think he's good for Israel. I don't think he's good for us. I don't think that the president of the United States should be in Netanyahu's pocket the way he is. Uh, and we need the release of the hostages, and we need to immediately get ab about the architecture well, of a 2 I want to make sure that you agree with that, uh, Congressman Phillips. Do you agree that Netanyahu is in the pocket of President Biden. No, that Biden is in the pocket. Sorry, that Biden Netanyahu. is in the pocket of, of Netanyahu. Um, and that there needs to be an immediate ceasefire? I think what Marianne just said about the immediate release of hostages. That I agree, but I'm asking you no, the other but, question. But, but, but this is really important because it's not getting enough news coverage. There are eight American citizens being held hostage by Hamas in Gaza right now. Eight Americans. When's the last time eight Americans have been held without the President of the United States? Morning, noon, and night, talking about it, trying to extract them, and using diplomacy to get them. What's out. the That's solution? The, the solution is using every single tool available to us. What does that mean? That means it could mean special forces to extract them. It could be using our diplomatic U.S. special rights. forces, possibly, if there is a plan. <coughs> but, by, but most importantly, is this, Dan? It is to elevate the case. 
the president's job is to defend this country first and foremost, and we are not defending Americans when they're being held hostage. You asked me the question about being in the pocket. No, I don't think either one of these men is in the pocket of one another. I do not think Benjamin Netanyahu is a proficient leader for Israel, a country I care deeply about. I think he is part of the problem. I hope Israelis, because they are the only democracy in the Middle East, I hope Israelis make the choice to change their government as soon as humanly possible, because the settlement policy and that right-wing government is going to ultimately lead to the let destruction me, of Israel. Let me get to, to something that's happened in the news now um, with regard to the U.S. strikes on the Houthis mm -hmm. uh, in, in Yemen yesterday, Mr. Uger. Um, some of your fellow Democrats uh, in Congress have been condemning uh, President Biden for what he views, and many Republicans and many others view, as a response uh, to attacks on U.S. vessels, et cetera. Do you believe that the Democrats who are saying that the president has no right uh, to respond in this way are correct? So what I'm really concerned about is the widening of the war. So Israel's now bombing in Lebanon. The Houthi rebels are bombing or capturing uh, ships only headed to Israel, uh, going through the Red Sea. And now we're beginning to bomb the Houthi rebels. How big is this war going to get? I am not going to Iran. If we, if we, if there's any Democrat talking about going to Iran, you're nuts. So I'm not going to tolerate any broadening of this war. We shouldn't send taxpayer dollars to it. You know what? So they, they, should, they, should, they should go they... around the Red Sea, and it raises costs 10 percent. So what? So we're they... going to go kill people for 10 percent extra profit just to be for clear. corporations? Just to be clear, so they shouldn't be responding. The U.S. should not be responding. If the Houthi rebels attacked a U.S. ship, then we are allowed to respond. Okay. But if they're saying, oh, my God, it's slowing down trade, do you know what it's called? It's called Operation prosperity, guardian of prosperity. No, no, prosperity means you're protecting capital and profits. I'M NOT STARTING A WAR FOR 10 PERCENT EXTRA I WANT TO give you, I want to GIVE YOU EACH 15 SECONDS TO RESPOND, MS. WILLIAMSON. THE HOUTHIS are, ARE ATTACKING THOSE SHIPS IN RETALIATION FOR THE FACT THAT ISRAEL IS BOMBING GAZA. THE WAY TO GET THAT TO STOP IS TO STOP BOMBING so GAZA. SO THAT SOUNDS LIKE YOU'RE JUSTIFYING WHAT THE HOUTHIS ARE DOING. YOU'RE BASICALLY no, SAYING... No, I'm not you're, YOU'RE SAYING they're, THEY ARE DOING THIS IN RESPONSE TO Israel. But that's true. They are responding to the fact that Israel is bombing Gaza. That's why they're doing it. That is their stated intent. We should not be supporting the bombing of Gaza at this point. What, this See, is just... But this is where I think there's an area of, of distinction. And Congressman Phillips, you haven't really been entirely clear on this. Do you disagree with Ms. Williamson and Mr. Uger on this issue, and specifically as it relates to the Houthis and Israel? I do. And because I'm the ranking member of the Middle East Subcommittee on Foreign Affairs, I know who the Houthis are, and this is an Iranian proxy group. That's true. They are a threat to the entire region. Mm -hmm. The fact is they are attacking maritime ships in the Red Sea. We, the United States, gave them time and time and time again a warning that we would act if they continue doing this, and I support the Biden administration. It, it became time that we respond. The Houthis are an Iranian proxy designed right. to cause the very mayhem in the Middle East that is occurring right now. I, Everyone, so I support the Biden administration. Everyone's going to stick around. We're still ahead. We've got a lot more issues to cover, including the southern border, which was raised. What do they think should be done to address this crisis? Do they think Donald Trump should be eligible to run for president? Plus, more of your questions. All of this coming up in a moment. We're back with the three Democratic candidates that the DNC doesn't want you to hear from. We're here because we believe voters should decide who they want to represent them and not a national committee. And yet, most Republican voters would say the same thing, that they want to decide who to vote for. And yet, the Secretary of State in Maine and Colorado, among others, are seeking to keep Donald Trump off the ballot, citing the 14th Amendment and his role in January 6th. So, Marianne Williamson, let me ask you, do you think that Mr. Trump should be kept off the ballot? You know, he has not been convicted of the crime of insurrection. He hasn't been. And so for a judge to just opine on this, I, I think it's very dangerous. The people who love Donald Trump are going to vote for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. We could indict him 91 more times. He could be in prison. People are going to vote for him. Anything we do to try to obstruct Donald Trump, this is not the way we're going to win in 24. We're going to win in 24 by offering the American people a better life, yep. by cutting the cord with an aberrational chapter of American history that has denied most people the promises of democracy. Mr. Uger, same... We will beat him on the issues. Mr. Let us not beat him in court. Mr. Uger, same question. Do you think that Donald Trump should be kept off the ballot because of the 14th Amendment? Yeah. No, I don't. Uh, I, I think the the voters should decide whether it's us in primaries being put on the ballots or Donald Trump in a primary or general election being put on a ballot. 
if we think democracy is on the line, we should actually participate in democracy. democracy. We should support democracy. <laughs> now, but I want people to understand the 14th Amendment is a complicated uh, issues in both Section 1 as it applies to me, Section 3 as it applies to Donald Trump, well, and let the courts decide that. Let's and be it, clear on r r with regard to you, right? You were born in Turkey. That's right. Um, and so there's a question about whether you're even eligible uh, to, to run for president. Uh, the 14th Amendment does talk about um, no person except a natural-born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of the Constitution uh, shall be eligible to the office of president, neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years, et cetera. So what is your argument as to why you should be eligible? Yes, so that's Article 2, uh, Clause 5. The 14th Amendment amended that, and it says all persons born or naturalized have due process and equal rights. And the way that American jurisprudence has gone so far is that the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause has protected protected classes, that is, race, gender, gender uh, orientation, and national origin. Title uh, VI of the Civil Rights Act protects discrimination based on national origin. Do so you think it would be discrimination to keep you off the 100 percent. It's unconstitutional based discrimination. We went to district court in South Carolina. The judge said it was one of the best argued cases. It was a really close call. We're appealing to the circuit court. And, Dan, every civil rights case is won by repeatedly saying, we demand equality, we demand equality until the courts give it to you. Me, and that is exactly what's going to happen. Congressman here. Phillips, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. had run as a Democrat. He's now in an independent. He's polling at a serious 15 percent or so so far. As someone who supports ballot access, do you support his run as an independent? I think any American who desires to run for public office should have the chance to do so. And I want to answer two questions at once. You just asked about Donald Trump on the ballot. I was trapped in the House chamber on January 6th. I'll say the quiet part out loud. Donald Trump inspired an insurrection. Every one of my colleagues in the Senate and House know it. We tried to prosecute him, and we failed. Do I think the Democratic Party should pursue legal channels to beat Donald Trump? No. The same way they shouldn't pursue the same channels to keep us off the ballot. We should let American voters be the judge and jury. And as it relates to RFK Jr., he has every right to run. He's listening to people better, frankly, than I think the president is. And yes, he should be able to access the ballot. He shouldn't have to spend 10 to $15 million to be on the ballot for someone getting that kind of support. No more than any of us have right. to spend millions to do the same thing. Ms. Williamson, I'd like you to listen to this question. This is from Skip uh, from New Jersey, who asks uh, this question. In an election as critical as this one, when you are inevitably unable to get enough votes to secure the nomination as Democratic candidate for president, will you commit here and now tonight to not running as a third party candidate, as third party candidates never win? Well, first of all, I, I don't have any problem saying I'm not going to run as a third-party candidate, but I have a problem with the question. First of all, that's just the DNC narrative. She inevitably will lose. If I inevitably lose, it's because they are keeping me off the ballot. It's because they are smearing me. It's because they are mocking me from the presidential podium. It's because they are doing all the shenanigans that they are doing. So then they create this narrative, well, you can't win, so why are you doing this? And you better give us a loyalty test. I think we should ask the president of the United States if, if Dean is the nominee, or if I'm the nominee, or if Jenk is the nominee, will he support us? This idea of the DNC just creating these concocted narratives to uh, anoint. There's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that gives incumbents an anointment. I am old enough to remember when Eugene McCarthy and Bobby Kennedy Sr. ran against Lyndon Johnson. He was the incumbent. Yep. I remember. No one considered it weird. We just considered it democracy. And no one said to Bobby Kennedy and Eugene McCarthy, now, do you you promise, be good boys and girls. No, this is a democracy. We all have the fair. right to be here. So I have a little bit of a problem. Fair, with this fair enough. All right. Thank now, you. Uh, Congressman Phillips, you had mentioned the border uh, before. The border continues to be flooded with migrants trying to cross in the United States, some doing it through the formal legal process, many others doing it illegally. President Biden now considering stricter asylum restrictions by, among other things, putting a cap on the number of asylum applications. Uh, let me start with you on that. Do you support President Biden on that? 
I, I think we are so misguided in how we're looking at this problem, Dan. The solution to me is very simple. We have a very broken asylum system. Most of the migrants coming to the U.S. are trying to declare asylum. We force them to save $10,000, their whole life savings, make this arduous journey to our border. They pay Mexican cartels all their money. They pro they're processed. They're dumped in the streets of El Paso with no money, no chance to work. And then we have this massive problem, including in New York City. What would I do? I would force the filing of asylum cases in countries of origin. We should build asylum campuses next to our embassies or our consulates to keep people safe, adjudicate the cases there. If they qualify, we bring them to the United States, we mitigate this whole mess, and then they have $10,000 per person to start their new lives in America. That's called problem solving. What we're talking about right now is politics, Mr. and that's why we are so... Mr. Uger, that's a form of remain in Mexico uh, that, that Congressman Phillips is talking about. Do you support that and what do you make of President Biden considering limiting the number of asylum applications? Yeah, I think it's a terrible idea. I think it's a concession to Donald Trump. It's not to say that there isn't a problem at the border. There is. There are different ways to fix it. So I have a variation of what uh, Dean is saying there. I would send an army of uh, judges to the border because the number one issue is processing the asylum claims quicker. And so, and the other thing that you have to do is you have to stop the flow of the migrants. And what, how can you do that? By doing a Marshall Plan for Latin America. It worked. In, we don't have a migrant problem from Germany and Japan and Turkey and Greece because we did a Marshall Plan and their economies grew and they became our strongest allies and our strongest friends. We could do the same thing in Latin America. Right now, Venezuela is a disaster. That is why so much more people are are coming to the border because there a lot of them are coming from Venezuela which they didn't used to if we help those countries we also help ourselves it's a win-win being more draconian and going in the direction of Donald Trump <laughs> does not help Joe Biden stop helping Trump so Ms. Williamson let me uh, give you another one of our uh, viewer questions this is uh, this is David from Minnesota let's listen over 73,000 people in the U.S. have died from fentanyl overdoses, but 86 percent of people smuggling fentanyl in to the U.S. Are, are illegal U.S. citizens. My question is, how will you solve the fentanyl crisis? Well, first of all, and I, and I do commend the president. He recently met with President Xi, and there, mm -hmm. he, he got an agreement that he would start clamping down on these um, these laboratories in China that, that manufacture the precursor chemicals. But I actually think that what we ought to do is to decriminalize drugs. I think we should end America's war on drugs. It has not solved the problem in any way. It has exacerbated it. We spent a trillion dollars on the war on drugs. When I was in, in college, we had 300,000 people in prison. We now have 2.3 million, and 46 percent of all federal prisoners are nonviolent drug offenders. They should be home raising their children. Why do I mention this? Because once we decriminalize drugs, once we end the war on drugs, and take that $100 billion that we spend a year, and let's spend a fraction of that every year on a network of recovery options. I don't want a drug czar. I want a recovery czar. We're going to help addicts recover. What's then going to happen? We are going to, by doing that, be taking power away from the drug cartels, right. taking Sorry. away their yep. black market. Time. This will um, give us the, the bandwidth and the resources to go after the real drug that is the Congressman public Phillips, enemy, and that is fentanyl. You, you talked about sort of legal immigration, right? People who are actually filing claims for asylum, et cetera. Uh, David from Texas has a separate question. Says the southern border is clearly a national security problem. Addressing it cannot wait for Congress to fix immigration policies. What do you propose to stop the unmanageable illegal mm -hmm. crossings into the United States? I think he's right. And as executive of the United States of America, your foremost responsibility is to protect America. We spend a trillion dollars a year right now overseas with our Pentagon, Dan. So what's the and solution? Yet, the solution is to be an executive and solve the problem at the border. How? We, we, we need buffer zones on both the Mexican side of the border and the U.S. side. We need to ensure that we have the right barriers, the right technology, and the right trained people. We need to change our asylum law. And I agree with Cenk. We are so misguided in how we invest our foreign aid budget. We do need a Marshall Plan. He's absolutely right, because you know what? What we're seeing right now is nothing compared to what is coming when people start fleeing famine and war and lack of water. We are going to have Never. mass migration waves that we're ill-prepared for, and the executive of the United United States should be paying attention to the border immediately, and he can, and he's not. Everyone's going to stick around. You've got a lot more to get to, including the economy, and we're going to talk about an issue that may be tough for some Democrats. Coming up.
Welcome back to the Democratic Presidential Forum with three candidates that the DNC seems to want to ignore in an effort to anoint President Biden the winner. We're here with three-term Congressman Dean Phillips, the Young Turks founder Cenk Uygur, and author and 2020 presidential candidate Marianne Williamson. Let's talk uh, policing in America. Police departments are having enormous struggles across the country, problems with recruiting, low morale. In the wake of the George Floyd case and the protests that ensued, many big cities moved to defund uh, the police, or as they said, reallocate resources at the time. But now, many of the same cities are reversing course, including San Francisco, D.C., Portland, Oregon, uh, Minneapolis, L.A., Congressman Phillips, do you believe the defund the police movement was a mistake? I think the name was a mistake. And look, at I come from Minneapolis, uh, where George Floyd was murdered, a city in which we mistook quiet for peace. Biggest problem I think this world faces right now. We think if it's quiet, everything's just fine. It's right below the surface. The injustice that has been propagated against the black community in this country is horrifying, and we have to acknowledge it. Defunding the police is not the answer. Funding the police with better trained cadets, funding the police with social workers and mental and emotional health providers. Yes, 21st century strategies to improve lives so that police do not be, are not burdened with this nonsense. I'm a white man. I've never had to have the talk with my daughters, the talk about driving at night, hoping my kids come home at night. We have to start being empathetic and understand that slogans like that work against all of us, particularly the communities that need the most protection. Mr. Uger, in 2020, you had tweeted, I'm now supporting defund the police 100 percent. Then two years later, you said, will people who came up with the defund the police slogan admit they were wrong? It was wildly counterproductive framing. Where do you stand yeah. today? Yeah, you're actually missing one more. In the beginning, I hated the slogan. And this, the tweet that you showed first was my reaction, my frustration with policing in this country, saying, for God's sake, are you guys ever going to change this? But my initial instinct of the slogan being terrible was correct. And I came back to that position because it doesn't work. Because what it leads people to think is that you're going to do no policing. That is not what anyone's in favor of. We want fair policing, not no policing. Of course you need police. Of course you need to protect people. What are progressives for? They're for justice for everyone. That includes the working class, the middle class, that suffer crime. And they suffer more than anyone else does. So the reality is the slogan is terrible, but we never change the culture of policing in this country. That's the number one problem. You know what the saying is, better to be judged by 12 than carried out by six. Every police department says that, and that is actually a terrible slogan. That means shoot first, who cares about the citizens? Better to protect yourself than to protect the citizens. So, that is the exact opposite of what cops should do. It, it, we want fairness and justice in both directions for the citizens and to protect them. I see you nodding, Ms. Williamson, but it sounds like what Mr. Uger is saying is that very often, too often, the police are the bad guys. And that's certainly going to lead to horrible morale among police officers around the country if the president of the United States is talking about how horrible our police are. Oh, we have to get beyond that sophomore conversation. Uh, we need to have a much deeper one. The issue is not how much money you spend. The issue is the training and, as Junk was just saying, the culture. Our police, if you look at how our police are trained compared to, let's say, a country, some of the European countries, where people spend much more time in training, two years as opposed to what might be six weeks here, and are taught to de-escalate, not... We're, we we so, go so quickly for lethal, lethal force, and everybody has seen it. We've seen it in videos. So Americans know that something is wrong. We know that there's infiltration of some of our police forces by white supremacist gangs. We've got to stop pretending to the American people what the American people, particularly black Americans, know. And I know that the majority of our policemen are very, very fine uh, men and women. But that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to address the very, very, uh, very, very uh, dark forces that are going on in our police forces around this country. No American mother, as black mothers do in this country today, have to be afraid that if they ask their son to go to the corner store and get a quart no. of milk, that he might not come home alive. This is so far beyond how much money we spend. It's well, about what our police really are doing. Well, I, I want to follow up with you on a somewhat uh, related issue. Yeah. You have advocated for reparations yes, uh, for slavery. Mm -hmm. You've pushed for $200 billion to $500 billion uh, to That's be paid trillion. to descendants of, of slaves. Yes. Where are you going to get that money from, number one? And number two, reparations is not a popular issue more broadly. In a general election, if you are the Democratic candidate, won't that be a terrible issue for you? 
First of all, I'm not running to be popular. <laughs> you're not running, you're not running to win, then? Oh, I am running to win. Oh. You know, there's a difference between the American people, the goodness, the decency, and the nobility of the American people, and what the political elite thinks is what's going on out there. I've spoken to many all-white audiences and gone through a little history lesson. Slavery began in 2016. You have almost 250 years of slavery, followed for the most part by another 100 years of institutional suppression of black people in the American South. 350. 50 years. That's a lot of kicking. And if you've kicked someone that long, you owe it to do more than stop kicking. You owe it to them to say, help me get back up. Now, I also want to point out that once we uh, close the wage gap between blacks and whites in America, the economy in the United States will be $1.5 trillion. Congressman longer. Phillips, do you support reparations? I'll tell you, if this country doesn't wake up to the fact that we have an obligation to repair the injustice that was done to African Americans, to the descendants of slaves, we are out of our minds. And do you support and, and, reparations? And here, here's, here's what I plan to do. I want to use a UBI program, Universal Basic Income Program, in the lowest income census tracts in America that will benefit descendants of slaves disproportionately, but also white people and, and Latino people and all kinds of people, because I think we should be preparing for what is coming, the AI revolution. Here's the second proposition. We should also establish what I call American Dream Accounts, where the federal government endows every baby born in this country with $1,000 in an account that is invested over time. When you graduate high school, you get it, and that will start closing the racial wealth gap in this country in miraculous ways. We, if we don't do this, Dan, it is the most existential threat to the country, the disparities between but the But, Mr. Uger, and that's not reparations no. that, that Ms. Williamson is talking violence. about. Do you support no, reparations as laid out by Ms. Williamson? So with reparations, uh, there's two factors. So number one, should we do it? And I was really struck by what Marianne said when she ran last time on a debate stage. She said, a debt is owed. Mm -hmm. And that's just a fact. 400 years of free service. That's just not fair. So if it happened to anyone, people would say a debt is owed. I did the work and I never got paid for it. Now, having said that, it is very difficult to execute reparations. So how black, how white? What if you're a quarter black? Does that mean you pay reparations because you're three quarters white or you get reparations because you're a quarter black? So my point is, there is a way to do this and it could be a baby fund. It could be lower interest rates UBI. on houses UBI. To, to build wealth for African-American families. Because right now, the average African-American family starts with 10% of the wealth of white families. I, we can make a difference I know this there. is an important issue for you. 15 seconds. Though. Okay. Uh, 20, over 20 years, the disbursement of a trillion dollars. If I owe you money, I don't get to tell you how to spend it. A, a council of black elders from all across culture, politics, arts, religion, and so forth, and two major categories, educational renewal and economic renewal, and the black leaders get to decide. Right, but I, I don't think either Mr. Uger well, or Congressman Phillips support that. Well, no, no, I don't, but give me, yeah. if, I could, yeah. if I could have 15 yeah. seconds. White families in America have about six times the wealth of black families in America. Our Constitution says all people are created equal. The only reason this is not equal is because of policies over much, much time. So the, the way to do this is close the racial wealth gap. That is something that conservatives and liberals Everyone's can come together on. Stick around. A lot more to cover with these three candidates in the discussion and debate. DNC doesn't want you to really see. Coming up. Welcome back to this Democratic Presidential Forum with three-term Congressman Dean Phillips, author and 2020 presidential candidate Marianne Williamson, and media entrepreneur Cenk Uger. Thanks to all of you again. Let's talk the economy. On a technical scale, it seems to be improving. Five straight quarters of overall growth. The U.S. labor market ended 2023 on a high note, adding more jobs than expected. Unemployment rate uh, considered low for about two years. President Biden is crediting what he's calling Bidenomics, uh, but most Americans aren't feeling it. A recent Gallup poll shows 32 percent of Americans approve of the president's handling of the economy, 67 percent disapprove. Ms. Williamson's statistics are one thing, but Americans also know how it feels in their pocketbooks. Why is there this disconnect? There's a disconnect because the official narrative is a lie. When they say the economy is doing well, it's doing well for 20 percent of Americans. But those 20 percent are like on an island surrounded by a vast sea of economic despair. When the majority of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, can't absorb a $500 unexpected expenditure, 39 percent of Americans report skipping meals in order to pay their rent. When we have the highest poverty rate of any event 
advance democracy, when we have people putting GoFundMe pages up on the Internet to pay for life-saving operations, one in four Americans living uh, with medical debt, over a million Americans rationing their insulin, a third of America's workers living on less than, working for less than $15 an hour, and half of them cannot find a place to live. Do you realize the level of rage that they well, feel when the president well, tells speaking them that the economy is doing well? well they just don't understand. Well, speaking of rage, and let me, this is from a viewer question, Congressman Phillips. Um, this is from Christopher from Texas. Congressman Phillips, Ms. Williamson, and Mr. Uger are each millionaires. Only one of them, Representative Phillips, has any prior experience as an elected official, only amounting to three terms in Congress. How can the candidates relate to the average American or instill confidence in the average voter? And let's focus specifically on the issue of the economy, that you're dealing with three wealthy people here. How can you relate? Well, Christopher, I would say, how can a man who has served his entire professional career since age 27 in Washington, D.C., I think, how can he understand what's going on in this country? If he wasn't so encapsulated in Washington, in the White House, and was out doing what we're doing right now, which is listening to people, he would understand the pain and the heartbreak. People can't afford their lives. Life is unaffordable in America, Dan, and it is the truth. Joe Biden deserves some credit for the macro economy. But as Marianne said, most of that accrues to the top 1%. People are furious that their president is telling them everything is okay. So let me tell you this. I've chaired the board of a health system. I've been a regent at a university. I've led businesses. I've started them. I've served in the nonprofit sector, and now I'm a third-term <coughs> member of Congress. Believe me, I've been in the real world, unlike most of my colleagues who are running this country right now, who have been encapsulated in a place that is so disconnected from reality. Mr. Uger, your response on this, but in particular, let's focus on this question uh, that uh, Christopher is asking about the fact that all of you are wealthy. How can you relate? Yeah, I mean, look, I was not born wealthy. Uh, my career uh, has been one of great struggle, as we uh, being a talk show host is not easy. <laughs> For 15 years, I was basically starving. I uh, ate Hot Pockets cereal. I, I used to apportion the amount of cereal I could eat at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So do I know the pain of being poor and the struggles of being <laughs> middle class? Absolutely. And so, look, the, on the economy, I'm fair and honest. So Joe Biden did actually a really great job on jobs. So but what our frustration with Joe Biden is that it's twofold. One is on policy, which I'll get to in a second. But on, it's he's terrible at messaging. He doesn't like campaigning. He doesn't like uh, attacking Republicans or Donald Trump. He created twice as many jobs as Donald Trump, more than twice as many. You know how much he's down on the issue of jobs? 19 points. He's losing to Donald Trump by 19 points, where he created twice as many jobs. He's down 24 points on the economy. That is why one of the, my URLs is BidenIsGoingToLose.com. <laughs> BidenIsGoingToLose.com. It's so now look. You were able the, to buy that? Yes. Yeah. And uh, and so and I've also got SelfishJoeBiden.com. Okay, <laughs> because he's got to get out of the race. But I got to say, on the economy, he's also done terrible right. uh, well, because they're, they're right. Wages I want to get too low. I want to get Ms. Williamson one more wage, quick question from from a viewer, and then we're going to get to closing. Uh, statements. This is from uh, Delmar from Nebraska, um, who says, how do you intend to get our national debt reined in and lowered? We're crushing our children's future. 30 seconds, please. I, I want to answer the one that came before, because I think I deserve to. First of all, I'm not a millionaire, because I put all this money into this campaign. But more here, than here. that, I have had a 40-year career, a 40-year career as a nonprofit activist, as a counselor. I have worked up close and personal with people whose lives were in despair. I founded an organization that has pay, uh, served 16 million meals to people with life-challenging illnesses who cannot leave their homes. What makes me the person most qualified for this position is that I have been up close and personal with people whose lives were in despair. Where the Biden administration sees economic data, I see human I'm gonna, suffering. I want to give you each a chance for a final, a final remark here um, to speak directly uh, to the audience, to tell them why uh, you think that you should be the next president of the United States. Congressman Phillips, why don't you start? Well, let me say the quiet part out loud on two fronts. Uh, first, about me. I, you just referred to me as a, a wealthy man. And I got lucky. Uh, my father died in Vietnam, uh, was a soldier, had to pursue an ROTC scholarship to attend college, and was killed in July of 1969. My mom was 24 and widowed, and we had to live with my great-grandparents for three years, at which point I got lucky. My mom remarried, and I was adopted into a great family, gave me opportunity, and I busted my tail for the last number of decades to get to where I am. But it shouldn't be a stroke of good luck or the zip code in which you're born in America to do well. Here's the other quiet part out loud. Joe Biden, A, should be here, and B, he's going to lose. 
He should exit this race. He should encourage not just the three of us, but a whole stage full of next generation Democrats ready energetically to get to it instill hope and optimism again like this country deserves. He's going to lose to Donald Trump and he's going to get crushed by Nikki Haley. We're here doing democracy. We're practicing it. Our party's not supporting it, but we hope that you support us in this mission because it is the most existential threat to our future and it is the legacy I know we can all... Cenk Uger, 60 seconds, your final remarks. So I'm running because the Democratic Party needs a fighter. We need to go fight Donald Trump. Donald Trump is, in fact, pathetically weak. He has gone bankrupt six times. He's a failed businessman. He's a lifelong criminal. For God's sake, Joe Biden, stop taking a nap. Get up and fight. And you don't do that. And that is why I'm worried to death that you are going to lose. You're in the 30s. The Democratic candidate must win by five in order to win the Electoral College. He's down by eight. That means he's down 13 overall. He's losing every single swing state. Part of the reason for that is because he doesn't fight. He doesn't fight us. He doesn't fight Trump. He doesn't fight Republicans. He keeps telling you how they're his friends. Well, they're not my friends. I came here to protect Democratic voters, to protect the average American, and to fight against Trump. That's so my website's jankforamerica.com. Everybody knows I'm a fighter. And everybody knows if you're going to go up against Trump, you can't do it meekly. You have to actually fight against them. And Joe Biden right now is losing every swing state. That's why I also have bidenisgoingtolose.com. He's down 20, right. 14 points with independence. Democratic Party, turn Thanks. around right now. We cannot afford to lose to Donald mm. Trump. And apparently Democratic leadership right. That's does fine. not mind that. Mar and I do. Marianne Williamson, your final remarks. The... Um, the Democratic Party needs to understand the psychological element of what's going on with Donald Trump. Donald Trump speaks to a part of the human brain that pulls people down into hatred and division. The only way to override that is to lift people up, to inspire people, to say to people, we can have a new chapter of American history. We can make an economic U-turn. We can cut the cord with an aberrational chapter that sought a $50 trillion massive transfer of wealth into the hands of 1% of Americans. We went from a thriving middle class 50 years ago to a collapsed middle class today. That's what the what the Democratic Party needs to promise. And that is why my career, as someone who has inspired and motivated people during times of crisis, you know, Franklin Roosevelt said that the primary responsibility of the president is not administrative, but rather moral leadership. And the, the, the founders of this country agree with me. In order to be president, they said, you have to have been born here, although, as Cenk will tell you, we've been at the living document. You have to have lived here for 14 years, and you have to be 35. They did not say you have to be part of a political elite or a congressman or a senator. They were leaving it to every generation. What do you right. think is the skill set that will, will be the, the right skill set to face the challenges of this time? Someone Thank who you. can say to the American people, we're going to start over an right. economic bill of rights, a department Thank of peace, a ending the drug war. We are going to do the things that give right. the American people a chance for Thank a better you. life. Marianne That's how we're going to beat Donald Trump. Thank you very much. Thank and you. look, we are sorry that President Biden did not want to be here uh, to be part of this. We invited President Biden again to join in what we view as an important discussion. I said this at the top. I'll say it again. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to agree with anything or everything the folks here have said. It's just about having them get their say. Dean Phillips, Marianne Williamson, Cenk Uger, thank you all for thank being you. here. Really thank appreciate you, it. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find News Nation on your cable provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.